Hey everybody, my name is Thad. Welcome to Redemption Church. We're so glad that you're joining us online today. If you could do me a big favor, since you're already watching on Facebook or YouTube, hop on Facebook and check in. For every two check-ins that we uh, get, we actually are providing vitamins for kids that are in need right now, so it's an important thing to do. While you're online or on your computer, if you could also fill out a Connect card, go over to redemption.cc. You could find the Connect card there. If you fill out a Connect card, that'd be a great way for us to be able to reach out to you, talk to you, pray for you, any concerns or cares that you have. We're here to help you guys. Uh, something else that we really value here at Redemption Church is our worship. So get comfortable, get relaxed, get your voices ready to go, and let's tune in for a great time of worship this morning.
thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you that you have come to save us. God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, it's in your name that we pray and we worship today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. My name is Adam, and it is so great to have the opportunity to connect with you today. 
Hey, I would absolutely love it if you do a couple things for me this morning. I would absolutely love it if you would open up your Bible or turn on your Bible. We're going to be in the book of Revelation today. And so uh, that's the very last book in the Bible. And so you can turn all the way there. Uh, also, as you're finding your place in Revelation, I'd love to encourage you, if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, maybe consider giving this video a like or a share. It would help more people discover uh, Redemption Church. It would help people discover uh, what we're teaching today out of God's Word. Uh, it's one way to kind of help advance the kingdom during this shelter-in-place season. So we'd absolutely appreciate a like and a share. It just helps the gospel go further faster. Hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe. We're actually trying to get to 100 subscribers uh, so we can get some of the added benefits that are free uh, that YouTube gives us once we get to 100 subscribers and we're super close. Uh, and so we really would appreciate a like or a share on Facebook or a subscribe on YouTube. Hey, before we dive into this week, I would encourage you to really plug in next week for Mother's Day. In fact, uh, in this season of uh, COVID-19 and shelter in place, I know that uh, some of our traditions or maybe some of the things we're used to doing or we enjoy doing, uh, we're not able to do. And so we'd invite you to maybe start a, a new tradition, maybe just even for this year. Uh, we would encourage you to maybe make brunch uh, for the mom in your life. And then uh, tune in to Redemption Church live stream at 11.30 a.m. And you're not going to hear from me next week. You're actually going to have the opportunity to hear from four women from within Redemption Church, some of our ministry leaders, who are going to be sharing an encouraging, life-giving word with you. Something that's encouraged them, something that gives them hope that they'd like to share with you. And so it's going to be a fun Sunday next week. And it would be even better if you were there participating with us. And so we're really, really excited about that. Well, hey, uh, anytime stuff like what's happening in our world happens, uh, people get really interested in the book of Revelation. In fact, uh, even this last few weeks, I've gotten emails and texts and questions about the book of Revelation and things that are happening in our world. And I'll get texts and emails about the Antichrist and dragons and the imagery of Revelation and the prophecy and what I'd love to do is spend some time together this morning uh, really putting our eyes on Jesus and walking through the book of Revelation. Now, here's the deal. We're not going to cover everything today, but I'd like to maybe take a, a snapshot of what the book of Revelation has to say. Uh, because as much as the book of Revelation is about end times and what's coming and prophecy, I think it's easy for us to get caught up with things like the beast and the dragons and the Antichrist and the, the spirit of Jezebel and all this kind of stuff. But really, the whole point of the book of Revelation is Jesus. In fact, not only is it about Jesus, I think it's about our lives today. I think we have an opportunity to see what God has to say in the book of Revelation and apply it to our lives today in a way that is powerful and encouraging and life-giving. In fact, I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make when they talk about the book of Revelation is people will talk about the book of Revelation without ever talking about Jesus. And I think the book of Revelation is really clear that it's all about Jesus. In fact, in the first five words of Revelation chapter 1, uh, John tells us what this is all about. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says, The revelation of of Jesus Christ. John says, hey, this whole thing is about Jesus. It's not the book of revelations. It's the book of revelation. It's one revelation. It's about Jesus. He says, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. John says, hey, I had this experience where an angel visited me and somehow through the power of the Holy Spirit, he has this experience or this vision or this visitation where he sees heaven and he gets some, some pictures of things that are happening, some that are yet to happen, and yet he is able to write it down for you and for me. And one of the first things I think we see in the book of Revelation that it's really all about is that we would get an accurate view of Jesus. I think one of the most important questions we can ask and answer is who is Jesus really? Not who have we made Jesus out to be, but who is Jesus. In fact, earlier this year, we did a study on Jesus just called uh, Jesus Is and studied some of the 
the remarks and the statements and the truth that Jesus made about himself. In John chapter 6, Jesus says that he is the bread of life, that he fulfills our inner hunger, that he satisfies our unsatisfied souls. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Uh, maybe there's some of us that feel like we live in darkness. Maybe we feel like there's darkness over our lives or our country. And Jesus says, I am the light that shatters the darkness. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He says that he cares for us. He loves us. He leads us. He protects for us. And he even provides for us. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the gate that he is the only way to the Father, he is the only way to salvation, that he is the only way to experience eternal life. In fact, in John chapter 11, Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life, that even when it seems like we're experiencing death in our lives, maybe death spiritually, death emotionally, maybe uh, death just even in our lives, maybe we have anxiety and fear, Jesus says he is the resurrection that he brings the dead back to life. In John 14, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. Maybe you're looking for direction in your life. Jesus is the way. He is the truth and the life. And then in John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I will remain in you and you will bear much fruit. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing like we have to answer this question of who is Jesus because let's be really honest. God is bigger than we let him be. Like we often don't look at who is the God of the Bible. We kind of create God in our image, a God that we would like. But one of the things the book of Revelation wants to do is give us a bigger, clearer picture of who Jesus is. In fact, in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11, John gives us kind of an updated snapshot, an updated picture of who Jesus is and what he looks like. He says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has the name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, I think maybe one of the things God wants to do in your life and my life today is give us a bigger, clear, updated picture of Jesus. Because you know what happens is sometimes we kind of turn Jesus into our version of Jesus. Like sometimes we, we turn Jesus into this really nice guy with a really white smile and really beautiful blue eyes and beautiful, healthy, shining, bouncy, panting, pro-V hair. And Jesus was a, a nice guy who would never see anything that causes conflict with you. And he just kind of carries around baby lambs and teaches nice lessons. But the reality is, is that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And see, this becomes so important because when we have a small view of Jesus, we'll tend to negotiate with him instead of walking in joyful obedience to him. You know, when we have a really small view of Jesus, we begin to doubt his ability to care for us, provide for us, lead us, protect us, or even fight our battles on our behalf. And what I love about this passage is this is John. This is John who was one of the first disciples of Jesus. Uh, he knows Jesus. He's been with Jesus. He loves Jesus. In fact, on the cross, uh, Jesus has this moment that he looks at his mother Mary and he looks at John and he basically tells Mary that John is now her pastor, that she should follow his lead. And he tells John that he wants him to take care of his mother Mary. I mean, that tells me everything I need to know about the character and the personality and the relationship that John had with Jesus. And this is John seeing Jesus. 
Jesus, who he had spent time with, who he had, had walked with, who he saw crucified, who he saw dead and buried, who he even saw after his resurrection. But now he sees him ascended in heaven and he goes, let me tell you about Jesus. He says, Jesus is powerful. Jesus is faithful and true. Jesus is a victorious warrior. Jesus is the word of God, that his eyes are like flames of fire, that on his head are many crowns marking his sovereignty and his royalty, that he commands the armies of heaven, that he wears a robe of fine linen that's been dipped in blood, that from his mouth comes a sharp sword, and on his robe and his thigh is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, one of the questions that you and I have to answer in our lives is who do we think Jesus is? Because scripture makes it really clear that Jesus is the King of Kings, that Jesus is the Lord of Lords, that Jesus is our mighty Savior of the whole world. And see, this is really important because the question that we get asked all the time is how do I know the will of God. Well, friends, if you want to know the will of God, you first have to know God himself. If you want to know what God wants for you, you first have to know who he is. Maybe one of the things that you could do today in your life is pray this really powerful prayer. You could pray, hey, Jesus, through your word and the power of the Holy Spirit, would you begin to reveal yourself to me so that I could know you more? Because I also think that's the second thing we see in the book of Revelation is not only do we get a bigger, clearer picture of Jesus, but we also are reminded that we have a God who passionately pursues his people and speaks to us. God pursues us. One of the things I love about God is I think a lot of people look at scripture and they think that scripture is just kind of an ancient book of rules of do's and do nots to follow. But that's not what I see. I think scripture is a love letter given to us by God so that we could know him and what he's like so that we could come into relationship with him so that we could understand who he is and what he's like and what his grace and his mercy and his love is. And see, one of the things that happens in scripture is when a scripture repeats itself over and over again, I think we really have to pay attention. I mean, all of scripture is really, really important. All of scripture is God breathed and should be taken seriously. And yet I think when God says the same thing over and over and over again, it's because he's trying to get our attention, because he's trying to drive that point home. And in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, God says the same thing seven times over and over again. He says this, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2.11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2.17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 2 verse 29, you, you want to take a guess? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 3, verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 3, 13. Let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. Come on, say it with me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now here's the thing. I've never claimed to be the sharpest tool in the shed. But I think the scripture is making it really, really clear that God is a God who speaks. But the question is, are we listening? Like, are we getting into God's word? Do we know what he's like? Do we know the sound of his voice? Are we listening to what he's telling us and then applying it to our lives and walking in joyful obedience to him? Now, I get it. We usually don't want to hear God's word because we know that God's word will redirect the course of our lives. That often when we hear from God, uh, we hear something that we don't always like, or it's in conflict with something that we believe or something that we enjoy, and God is redirecting us. But when God speaks to us, we have to realize that he always gives us his best. 
And so when God says to do something, it's not because he's this commander that just wants to rule your life. He also wants to give you the best that under his rule and under his authority and under his reign that you would experience life to the full. And then when God says don't do something, it's not that he's a cosmic killjoy. The reason that forbidden fruit is forbidden is because it never delivers. It never satisfies. It only leads to death. And that when God speaks to us, he's always giving himself to us. He's always giving us his best. So here's the question. What is God trying to communicate to you today? Now here's the thing. The answer can't be nothing. We use that all the time. Like, hey, what did you learn at school today? Nothing. What, what happened at work today? Nothing. Did you have any interesting conversations today? No, nothing. Nothing. But the reality is, is that God is always speaking. He's always pursuing. And I want you to know as your pastor that I believe the greatest thing for your life and the greatest thing for my life would be that we would know who God is. And that by grace through faith, we'd have a relationship with him, that we would know his voice and hear his word and then walk in joyful obedience to him. So what is God speaking to you? Maybe he's telling you that you need to forgive someone. Maybe he's telling you that you need to pray for someone. Maybe he's telling you there's some things that you need to readjust in your life so that you could experience his blessing in his fullness of life. Like maybe God's telling you that you need to apologize to something for someone. Maybe God's speaking into some areas of your life that, that you've been unwilling to turn over to him. But the best possible thing you could do is hear from God and then respond by saying yes to God. In fact, that's the third snapshot we get from the book of Revelation is worship. The revelation always demands response. But what I mean that by that is whenever God reveals himself to us by his word or by his Holy Spirit, like it always demands a response for us. The way I like to say it is this. I think it's a sin for us to give God a golf clap. Have you ever watched a golf game? Like a guy can make the sweetest shot in the word, you know, world, sink the hole in one. And this is, this is like the clap they get, you know, like it, it doesn't make any noise. Like when we see God for who he is, uh, it's wrong for us to give him a golf clap. And in fact, John tells us in heaven that heaven is filled with the worship of Jesus. And in fact, last week we talked about rewards, that one day when we stand before God as believers, we'll receive a, a crown or a reward for the way that we lived and the way that we responded. And, and many theologians and scholars believe that these elders are wearing those crowns. It's their reward. And it's the only thing of value that they have in heaven. You know, they don't have a home. They don't have a savings account or a checking account. They don't have a 401k. The only thing of value they have is their crown. It's their reward given to them by Jesus. But what it says is that when they get in front of Jesus, they do something with their crown. Look at this, Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 10. It says, The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him, he who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed, and they were created. Like, this is amazing. These elders took everything that they had of value. They took their crowns. When they got before Jesus, they said, You know what's more worthy? You know what's more valuable? You know what really deserves our praise? It's Jesus. They said, these crowns don't belong on our heads. These crowns belong at the feet of Jesus. You know, it's true in our lives that we give up things that we love for things that we love even more. And for the elders, they get before Jesus and they're praising him and they're, they're crying out and singing with angels and, and all kinds of people that are saying, worthy is the lamb. And then they lay down their crowns at the feet of Jesus. You know, for you and me, that means that we cannot claim to be followers of Jesus and also withhold things from him like our time, our energy, our talents, our families, our resources, our possessions, or even our finances. Like worship means that we stop trying to play games with an almighty God. It means that he becomes the priority. It means that he becomes the center. It means that he is worthy over all things, that we desire him over all things, that he gets the final word in all things. 
And then we get some more information. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. You know, sometimes we don't worship Jesus the way we should. It's because instead of seeing him as worthy, we see ourselves as worthy. And hey, I think you and I could begin to experience heaven on earth today. But it begins with seeing Jesus for who he is. Uh, For seeing him as the King of Kings, the Lord and Lords. For seeing him as the ruling, saving Messiah of the world. And then responding to him by putting our faith in him, by trusting him, and then directing our worship to him, saying, hey, Jesus, all that I have is yours. There's nothing that I would withhold from you. In fact, that which I think is the greatest, when I get in front of you, that just belongs at your feet. In fact, I love as John talks about heaven, one of the things he tells us is that heaven will be a packed house. I absolutely love that. That's one of the snapshots of Revelation is that heaven will be a packed house. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 and 10. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. I love this because I think John like tries to start to count like one, two, three, okay, 10, 20. Then he's like, forget about it. It's just so many people will just say myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. Like there is no social distancing in heaven because it's a packed house. And listen, church, I want Redemption Church to have a hand in overcrowding heaven. I mean, seriously, that's the whole reason we started Redemption Church is we want to see lives changed by Jesus and disciples made. And I think that's one of the reasons, even though we're thankful for technology, even though we're thankful for the ability to do what we're doing together whenever you're watching this. But the reason that we miss Sundays so much is because Sundays is like a picture of heaven. It's actually practice for heaven that we would come together, that we would pack the house, that we would take our eyes off of ourselves. We put our eyes on Jesus and together we would worship him and we could hear one another's voices praising and singing and that this is preparation for all of eternity where we will see Jesus and love Jesus and put our crowns at Jesus' feet and worship him. And by the way, the music in heaven is going to be loud and I think that's going to be awesome. And hey, church, like just something to think about. If you've talked with people, and as you've you've talked with people, if you've talked about more about COVID-19, YouTube videos, conspiracy theories, and how much you disagree with the governor, then you have Jesus, then we are completely missing an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God and make an eternal difference in people's lives. Like the reality is what people need in this season of uncertainty is the hope and the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. And God has positioned you and me right where we are to be salt and light, to be ambassadors, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people. And because that's what how people make it to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. People who have been saved by Jesus go to heaven. Because this is what kind of shakes me up a little bit. Like up to this point, this has all been really awesome. But then there's this thing that happens next that shakes me up a little bit. A snapshot number five is that there'll be a final proclamation of the gospel. In Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7, John says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Like we're supposed to live with some anticipation. We're supposed to live with a sense of urgency because salvation, while it's awesome, why it's free, why it comes by grace through faith, it is a limited time offer. 
Like sooner or later, time will run out. And what John says is there comes a moment where an angel will preach the gospel, proclaim it one last time, and after that, there is only reward or wrath. That there's coming a time, there's coming an hour, where we will no longer be able to share our faith. The opportunity for salvation will be closed. And I think that the reason we have prophecy is because knowing what's going to happen in the future should influence how we live our lives today. And so we need to begin sharing our faith with urgency. We need to begin sharing the gospel boldly with love because we don't know when that day will be. Listen, there are people dying, meaning that their day is ending for that opportunity. And so we can't wait. We can't put this off till tomorrow. The people of God are supposed to be sharing the gospel, sharing our faith, letting people know who God is and how they can have a relationship with him through Jesus. And so listen, if you are talking more about COVID-19 than Jesus, we need to reframe that conversation because God has given us the good news so that it could go to the ends of the earth. And then one of the other snapshots we see in the book of Revelation is after the final proclamation of the gospel comes the wrath of God. Now I get it. Nobody likes to talk about the wrath of God. We kind of like to sweep this one under the rug. But the more I study the wrath of God and the longer I walk with Jesus, I feel like the more I begin to understand the wrath of God, but I'm only scratching the surface. See, I think the wrath of God will either cause fear or faith. It all depends on where the wrath of God falls. Revelation chapter 16 verse 1 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. God's wrath is so big and so powerful, it has to be poured out seven times. But the reality is, is the wrath of God either falls on you or it falls on Jesus. If the wrath of God falls on you, it's a terrible, fearful thing and it will destroy you. But what the scriptures tells us is that on the cross, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God for those who believe that the wrath of God has already fully been poured out on Jesus. So in Revelation 16, when the wrath of God falls, for those of us who are in Christ, the wrath of God has fallen out on Jesus and we're protected and we're fine. We will never experience the wrath of God like it's talked about here because Jesus dealt with it for us, which builds our faith. Because the wrath of God doesn't just fall on people. It falls on all of the earth. It falls on things like injustice and destroys it. The wrath of God falls on sin and its curse and destroys it. It it falls on poverty and sickness and hunger and wickedness and even death itself and it destroys it. Not only does God destroy everything that's wrong in the world from sin, but he replaces it with something better. That's the last snapshot, number seven, that we get from the book of Revelation today is we see peace. You know, we live in a disappointing world. Like, have you ever really looked forward to something only to be disappointed by it? Like maybe you thought that vacation was going to be awesome or if you thought you got that new job or maybe you thought if you got that, you know, that level in the bank account or if you got that new technology or if you were going to have that experience, man, that you would just be good only to get it and to never be satisfied. Like we live in a world that disappoints us and never satisfies us. But the book of Revelation tells us there is a day coming where we will experience the presence and the peace in the goodness of God fully. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 3, John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Like one day, everything will be made new. One day, everything will be right. One day, we will see Jesus face to face and we will experience the shalom peace of God, that we would be fully at rest, fully at peace, no sin, no suffering, no separation, no brokenness, no aching, that we would be fully at peace and fully satisfied in Christ Jesus. By the way, this is why I always say the best is yet to come. 
Because it's not necessarily that we're promised a great tomorrow, but when we're promised this day, it means that the best is always yet to come, that one day we will stand face to face with Jesus and be completely at peace. That we would experience joy, hope, peace, worship, and satisfaction like we have never experienced it before. Now here's the thing. I think sometimes we read the book of Revelation and we get so caught up in the imagery and the dragons that we don't do anything with it. And see, I think what John wants us to know is that there's things that are coming, but those things that are coming should actually impact the way we live today. Like I think one of the things John says is that you and I don't have to wait until heaven to experience the presence and the peace of God, that we can know Jesus today. That by grace through faith, we can have a relationship with Jesus where we know him and we experience his joy and his hope and his peace and his salvation. That we can actually know God and hear his voice. That we can actually begin to hear from him and that he would lead us and shape us and guide us and inform the way that we live. That we don't have to wait till heaven to worship that our lives is worship, that our lives is really practice for eternity, that you and I, by the power of the Holy Spirit, enabled by the Word of God, have the opportunity to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength today. Like, we don't have to wait to heaven to put our crowns at the feet of Jesus. We can do that today. And that we could actually begin to work towards the occupant limits of heaven, that we could just fill that place up that we could share the gospel today, that we could declare the good news of Jesus Christ with our friends and our families and our neighbors and our loved ones and our coworkers today, that the most loving thing that you could do is introduce someone to Jesus and give them an opportunity to respond to the good news that you have responded to. So listen, as you read through the book of Revelation, you'll either be caught up in fear or caught up in faith, but I think it all comes back to who you think Jesus is and what your relationship is with him. And I think John wants to give us an opportunity to get a bigger, clearer picture of Jesus so that we can begin to experience his will, his desires, uh, his purposes, his plan for our lives today while we wait for the day that we see him face to face. Hey, would you pray with me? Father, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that today you would give us a bigger, clearer picture of Jesus. That we would see Jesus as our Savior, the Lamb of God who was slain, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our mighty Savior. And God, I do believe that for some watching today, today is their day of salvation. God, I pray through the leading of the Holy Spirit that you would guide them, that they would repent of their sin, that they would make you their Savior, that they would walk with you. I believe that you could do that today, Jesus. And for those of us who are saved already, for those of us who have a relationship with you, God, forgive us for being comfortable and complacent. God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would fill us with passion and boldness, that we would live for your glory and that we would live on mission to see lives changed by Jesus and disciples made. God, I pray that we would share our faith, that we wouldn't hide, that we wouldn't be shy, God, but we would be your salt and light, your ambassadors who would declare the good news of Jesus Christ into our world, even for a time like this. God, I pray that during this time together that you would just remind us of your words, God, that you would speak to us. God, I pray for everyone hearing today that they would hear your voice, they would know your word, and they would respond to you by grace through faith. Amen. Well, hey, we love you, and we would love to be able to walk alongside you on your spiritual journey. Uh, If you haven't yet, fill out a connect card at redemption.cc backslash info. We'd love to be able to pray with you or follow up with you. If you made the decision to follow Jesus or if you're a new Christ follower, uh, we don't think you should do that alone. We'd love to be able to encourage you and give you some resources and be able to walk alongside you. Hey, if you're part of the Redemption family, we love you so much. If there's any way that we can uh, connect with you and serve you or encourage you, we'd love the ability to do that. 
But hey, what we're going to do next is I'm going to invite you to worship with us. And our worship team is actually going to close out our time together by singing a song that's actually based on Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And so here's what I would encourage you to do. Turn up the volume, maybe get up off your couch. And as we sing this song, we actually get to join what John said is already happening in heaven. That we actually get to sing some of the same words that the angels and the, and the elders and the created beings there are, are singing and praising Jesus. So let's give God the glory because he is good, because he is able, and because he's able. Let's worship together.
Hey, as we close out our time together, one of the things that we do every first Sunday of the month is we take communion together. Uh, and so if you have some bread sitting around or some, some grape juice, or really you can use whatever you have available to you, we want to take communion together. Uh, we believe that you are the pastors of your home and that if you feel like, you know, your kids, are, they have a relationship with Jesus, that they know who he is and what communion is all about, then they should take communion with you. Uh, that we take communion seriously, uh, that it's it's part of what we believe about Jesus, that we believe that his body was broken, that his blood was shed, that, that his life is really the new covenant that we have with God. And so when we take communion, it's an opportunity for us to confess our sin, our need for a Savior, and also trust and put our confidence that Jesus is the way, is the truth, is the life, that he is the Messiah, and that we love him, and that we believe in him, and that we're living for him, and we can't wait until we can see him face to face. In fact, Paul gives us instructions for communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the light that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. He says, For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Everybody, thanks again for tuning in today. We're so glad that you joined us. We hope you enjoyed the time of worship and uh, the word that was delivered today. We want to encourage you guys to continue uh, on with us. If you could do that by filling out a Connect card if you haven't already, just tell us what we can pray for you on. We're all about seeing lives changed and disciples made. So it's important for us to be able to be able to pray for you as well as to be able to reach out to you if you've made the decision today to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. So hop online, fill out a Connect card. While you're there, you can also give online the Redemption website. Address is listed below, redemption.cc slash give. Uh, but go online there. We'd still love to uh, see those tithes and offerings coming in. And one final thing, we want to make sure that you receive the blessing this week. Remember 624 through 25, the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.